Hi everybody, it's uh, John back again with another model in box of you. Um, this is a, a slightly complicated review because the kit itself isn't complicated, but the options and costs are. So I've put up a number of photographs to explain the differences between the different variants of this particular aircraft, the Grumman TBM or TBF Avenger. Um, this is actually a TBF Avenger. But the aircraft was also built in the TBM Avenger, and the only difference really between the two initial um, designations of the early variants that were released was that TBFs were built by Grumman and the TBMs were built by General Motors. Um, and General Motors built an awful lot more than Grumman ever did because Grumman were quite heavily um, involved in the production of Grumman Hellcats, Grumman Wildcats. Um, and new designs that were coming off the drawing board in the in the shape of the bear cat and the tiger cat towards the end of 1944 and General Motors produced some 4,000 over 4,500 of these aircraft which is around about three times what Grumman actually built um, for the war effort but this is a picture of a TBF this is a Grumman built uh, Avenger if you like an early production series Avenger that's in service with the US Navy. Um, the model we're actually looking at inboxing reviewing today is the Airfix um, TBM Mark III Avenger. Um, originally this kit was released in 1966 as a Series 2 kit and as a Series 2 kit um, even I was quite surprised um, when I first saw it on the shelves when I was probably, I mean I'm talking about the mid 70s, this wasn't when the kit was released but it was still Series 2 when I first saw it on the shelves and I thought that is a seriously large model with a lot of plastic in the box and it, it's, um, yeah, it, it was really good value for money. But FX did release it on a red stripe Type 3 box in 1966 and the plastic inside this box would have been midnight blue. Um, the Type 3 box went through to the Type uh, 3 box release from Airfix by Craftmaster. The plastic inside this kit, I'm almost certain, would have been white, and it wasn't as superior plastic type than the one that Airfix would use back in England. Um, I've had quite a lot of subbers explain to me that the plastic used by the Airfix by Craftmaster kits was quite brutal and not so easy to work with. Um, but it was the same kit, the same moulding, same instruction uh, same decals, everything was identical to the original Airfix release the same year. Still in a Series 2 format, um, which also went on through to 1973 when the kit was released in a Type 4 box. Um, the red stripe and the logo, this was the first time the logo in the circular form was introduced, which came in around about 1973 on the Type 4 boxes. Prior to that, they were Airfix scrolls type flags, if you like, um, and the kit, in, the the sprue inside would have still been midnight blue at this point, and the kit was still Series Two. In 1975, MPC um, released this model, and it came with a set of six crewmen, um, which was quite interesting. Um, I've never seen this kit, but I'm guessing it would still it would now be quite collectible. But it is the original Airfix um, tooling inside with five crew members, sorry, six crew members, in addition to the original kit. Um, not sure what colour the sprue would have been inside. Um, I'm not 100% sure, but it probably would have been midnight blue again. Um, but don't quote me on that because I'm not 100% sure. But that was 1975, MPC's release of the Grumman TBM3 Avenger. Then in 1979, something happened with this kit that was with a lot of people who um, were born and brought up on Airfix. Airfix, um, obviously they were undergoing a lot of financial restraints and problems that were going on with the, with the price of fuel and everything, and you know, crude oil prices going through the sky. And the price of plastic model kits did actually rise quite a lot in Britain probably as much as 40 to 50 percent in 12 months but abroad the sales export sales especially to the US where the dollar grew in value against the pound 
these kits were twice the price, sometimes a bit more. And a way in which Airfix um, tried to manipulate the way in which people perceived the kit was they re-released original moulds um, in a higher series number. And this kit was released in 1979 as a new model, but it's still the same tooling as what was inside the Series 2 kit. But this time it came in a Series 3 box. Um, I'm pretty sure the plastic inside this box would have been grey as well. It wouldn't have been the original Midnight Blue. Um, but this this was nearing the time when Airfix um, were going into financial difficulty, and they were looking for looking for some money basically. Um, that was the Type Five Stroke Six boxing, and then in 1984, <clears throat> when the new owners who had this company, I think it was Borden Incorporated, by then in 1984 uh, to 86, they released these kits in what I call the um, the Palatoy marketed boxing, where the kits were um, introduced on in made-up form, photographic images of the aircraft kit made up, on a blueprint-style base, um, and it was a sort of a it was a big it was a big thing because not many other companies Revell did mess around with this sort of format um, in the early 70s um, with three dimensional views of the three different versions that you can get in a box they often use them on the very cheap kits the series one biplanes and some of the series like they were they were early the low price bracketed kits like the single engine fighters and biplanes from world war one um, and this kit was released in again in nineteen uh, in nineteen eighty four to eighty six in series three. The kit was eventually released um, in this format. This is the last format of the kit that was released uh, by Airfix, and this came in nineteen ninety five. And this is actually the boxing that I've got to review. Um, and this this box was released uh, by McGuinness. In and so and Sons or Co or whatever they were, they were McGuinness, the McGuinness brothers, if you like, um, and they released this kit in this style boxing with grey plastic inside. The kit's in entirely made of grey plastic now, um, which is a shame because I quite liked a lot. You know all the old models that are in different colours, so I always found them quite exciting. I wonder what the kit's colour sprues are going to be when you open the box. It was quite exciting in those days. You know, when I was in my um, teenage, early teenage, maybe pre-10-year-old era, where I was still building bit models uh, not very well. Um, so that was 1995, and that was the last release from Airfix of the Grumman TBM3 Avenger. Now, what I want to quickly do is I want to quickly go through some of the variants so that you can understand when you're going through the options and costs what some of these Avengers look like. This is the standard production TBF stroke TBM Avenger. TBFs were built by Grumman, as I said before, and the TBMs were built by General Motors. And these were the, the standard torpedo bombers, um, depth charge bombers that were issued to the Allied forces during World War II, but initially to the US Navy. Um, and the reason, a lot of people don't realise, but the reason why the aircraft was actually called the Avenger is directly linked to Pearl Harbor. Um, this aircraft was rushed into service and it was called the Avenger by the um, United States Navy who were looking for an aircraft to take the war seriously back to Japan. And the Avenger was an interesting aircraft because it, it was actually the largest and heaviest single-engined combat aircraft of World War II. It was enormous. As you can see from the pilot figures inside this aircraft, you can see them here. This aircraft is massive, and it I can't remember exactly how much it weighs, but it's probably well in excess of six or seven tonnes, which was quite a lot for an aircraft in World War II. That's a standard production TBF and TBM, which came in TBF-1s, TBM-1s, TBM-3s, TBM-5s, um, and TBF-5s. The, the next variant I want to show you is the TBM-3R. This was a specialised... Um, aircraft which was fitted with a lot of avionics uh, for the maritime reconnaissance and um, if you like spotting they, they were they had a lot of electronic equipment built into the interior of the aircraft and they had their bomb base filled out and replaced with a fuel tank for longer range 
and the aircraft um the, t the turret out of the aircraft and basically put a glazing fairing over the top where the turret would have been but the aircraft was essentially the airframe was identical to the standard tbm um, and there are options available to build this particular version there are also options available to build the tbm 3s2 which was um, a specialized version which had a completely redesigned upper decking here with the cockpit canopy um, all filled in and a proper fa fairing built into the section which would have normally have housed a turret. But the turrets were never put into these aircraft. Um, and they they generally served with the Japanese Air Self-Defence Force after World War II. And you can get a model of that. I think it's built by Hasegawa. We'll get through that in the options and costs later. But that's a TBM-3S2. They also built a TBM-3W Guppy. Now, virtually every Western Air, uh, naval force used this aircraft in two major roles the airborne early warning role which is what it was designed for but a lot of nations found that this aircraft could be used in the anti-submarine hunting role where you had um, a specialized aircraft such as this with a search scan radar dropped underneath and these aircraft could in theory uh, detect submarines at periscope depth or on the surface even as far away as 12 miles um, and they, these were heavily utilised by the US Navy as late, well, as early as 1944, going into 45. But the French Air Force and the Royal Naval Fleet Air Arm also used these aircraft post-war, right up to around about the mid to late 50s. And you can get models of these in 72nd scale as well. You can also get um, a Tarpon Mark I, which was the original name awarded to the Avenger in Royal Naval Fleet Air Arm Service. Uh, they were basically a TBM or a TBF variant of the aircraft. It's standard uh, production uh, format, but they were awarded, as was a lot of American aircraft during World War Two. They were they received an, uh, an a specialist name awarded to them, and Tarpon was the name chosen by the Fleet Air Arm for this aircraft. You can get this. You can get a version of this as well um, in seventy second scale. Also, the Royal Naval Air Service also, and the French Fleet Air Arm used an aircraft called an AS Mark IV. These aircraft had a ventral radome below here, and they were these aircraft had uprated engines and revised fuel layout for extra long-range operations. And they were specifically built in two major variants, one which was this format as the AS Mark IV, and they also had the ASW Mark IV, which was the aircraft that carried the, the ordnance to destroy the submarine. But this variant was the aircraft that was used to search for the submarine. And they often went out and hunted killer pairs. Um, so that, that's the AS Mark IV as well. We'll just leave you a nice image here of, this is a TBM-5, I believe, um, which is in the air show circuits around the United States somewhere. And I think this is a really nice looking example of a, of a Grumman Avenger. And you can see the uh, the bulky, really chunky, strong airframe design of this aeroplane. It really was a nice piece of work. Anyway, what we'll do now is we'll just quickly pan the camera down and have a nice kit that we've got in view here. Here we go. stand is manic isn't it there we go i think that's a bit better i got a bit of that shadow out a little bit there we go that's a bit better isn't it oh god i really need to get a better stand because this stand is getting more and more difficult to um man manipulate and hold its shape and hold its position yeah i think that's better right let's have a look at this particular kit the box itself is quite large. It's quite a nice image on the front. I quite like this image, but it's not a patch on the early Roy Cross artwork that was used in the Series 2 models. You get uh, skill level level 2 on the side of the box, um, and this is definitely a McGuinness boxing. And on this side you've got um, dimensions of the kit, how many parts, are so 56 parts in this model, and all the humble paints that they suggest you need to paint this model up. That does cover the, the the variants that are included in the in the kit as well. We'll just open the 
open the contents up because the contents are quite interesting. This is one of the later um, releases, so I'm not expecting to have any issues with the decals, but we'll have a look at those in a minute. The instruction leaflets are quite interesting. You've got a, a separate instruction leaflet with the um, the stats history and the gun from the front in five different languages. You can see it in English there with a the header at the top, French, German, Spanish, and I think that's um, Swedish, I think. And on the back, you've got lots of other different languages for special instructions and the key codes and you know the decals and paint that are required all these key codes are all there in place to you know help you know what to do and what and what not to do with the various parts you've got some little sheets of information here have a look at that in a minute you've got a super models range what that means i don't know but it's interesting and it also comes i think with a Supermodels catalogue application, which at the time apparently cost two pounds to cover the postage and packaging, and that's their Humbrol address when they were owned by Humbrol. Humbrol Group. Interested Marfleet, and then you've got a, a flash service. There are three of them in here actually. There are three pits. I think you're only supposed to get one. Um, there are actually six of them, they're double sided. But these are basically complaints forms where you write off for replacement parts. Um, quite interesting. And also, there's information there about getting a supermodel leaflet, whatever that was. Instructions. The instructions for this kit are A4 sized. <clears throat> And the kit builds up in five different sections you can see there on the back on the front cover you've got just a blank piece of paper and then you've got the build sequence there i'm um, not going to go too pedantic into this because it's pretty self-explanatory really um, i think the interior is quite detailed but airfix kits of naval aircraft generally were especially series two and series three kits but this is, of course was originally a series two kit um, there are actually two crew figures in this aircraft the pilot who sits in part two, the front seat there, he sits in the front with his joystick. And the second crew member goes into the rear turret. So you can see there part 12 and he fits into part 14, the turret base. Quite a lot of glazing going on and moving parts. The rear tail wheel with the arrestor hook attached, that's a moving part. The turrets, um, the turret moves and I don't think the guns are supposed to elevate. Um, no, I don't think they're supposed to elevate. There's actually a third crew member here. I didn't realise this. There's a third crew member who sits in the rear ventral position to fire the the rear gondola section firing machine gun out the rear of the of the aircraft's belly there. And in sec that's section three. At section two, you're basically building the engine assembly. Um, I think it was a right cyclone 2800 that's the same engine that went into the um oh, i'm trying to think what it was it was the same engine i think that went into the 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 uh, martin marauder i think it was the same engine as that um section four you're basically building the wings and tailplane to put the airframe together and the ailerons will actually move on these the control surfaces and the wings and in section five you're basically putting the ordnance and the engine assembly and everything together these rockets they were called tiny tim rockets by the u.s navy and they were heavily utilized um, in the pacific theater uh, which was quite nice and also the the fleet air arm also utilized these um, and they were going to be fitted to the Avengers going into the um, the Pacific Theatre in 1945 when the European War finished. Um, but that's basically the, th the, th the five sections. You've got two suggested colours here of the fleet air arm. You're painting the aircraft entirely in 15, which I think is midnight blue. And in 34, I think, is an intermediate blue. But, but the, uh, the, the US naval version actually has three different colours. You have a dark blue, an intermediate blue, and the, the aircraft's white underneath, matte white. Right. Colorway, colour plans. There are two different options for this aircraft. Um, you've got a US Naval 
aircraft from 1945 in the Pacific Theatre. And the decal guide and placement guide and all, it's quite in, in, interesting. Now, I'm not a great fan of this style of paint plan because it's in black and white. And I know you've got different call like codes here, but to differentiate between that colour and this colour isn't as easy as it looks. There's 104 and 135. Where does that go? It's very difficult to see where it all goes. And then you've got 144, which is the intermediate blue. It, I was never a fan of this style of um, this style of paint plan guides. Um, on the other side, you've got the Fleet Air Arms TBM3 Avenger. After, after World War II finished, of course, the US, uh, sorry, the Fleet Air Arm just called the aircraft the Avenger. It wasn't called the Tarpon anymore. Um, and this aircraft is entirely finished in midnight blue. And I think it's a gloss colour, yeah, gloss midnight blue. Pretty similar to the tail fin colours of Lufthansa airliners, which was quite, you know, I always thought that was quite interesting. But um, I might do that colour because it's quite an interesting colour scheme. And I think you could probably get quite a good finish um, just using the gloss coat. The, d the decals on this kit are not fantastically good quality, but I think they're going to be usable. I think they'll come off all right. You've got common to both parts. You've got an instrument panel here, a decal. Well, I don't normally use these, but I might do on this kit. We'll have a look at the instrument panel in a minute. The decals themselves are pretty good register. They're as you would expect from an Airfix kit, even from the 1990s, as this one is. Um, but unfortunately, there is quite a bit of damage to this decal sheet, so reviewing this is not going to be as easy. But the, the decals, they are fairly raised, actually. They're quite thick. Um... These white double R's are quite thick, and the stars and bars, they're quite thick. But the British roundels, they're not too bad, which is nice. The fin flashes, they're a bit raised as well. So the decals, they're not cartograph, but they're not bad. And I think, you know, the decal itself, the decal sheet itself could have been in better condition, but there we go. Can't do everything, can you? Right, let's put that bag down there, and what we'll do is we'll go through the sprue parts first, like I normally do. And then I'll show you the large parts because this kit is a typical graphics model from the 1960s. And I'll explain what I mean by that. The transparency sprue on this kit isn't actually that bad. And that canopy, yeah, it's quite a big greenhouse canopy, but it's quite nicely framed. And I think it'll paint up quite nice. The turret, um, again, that's quite nicely framed as well. And you can see where the lines go. Um, not going to be as easy to paint as the actual greenhouse, but um, I think I think that will be all right. And the other the other glazing parts they're they're not too bad, but the actual quality of the plastic is quite good. And that glazing panel is quite clear, isn't it? So I think I'll be you know I'm quite happy with that. That's quite good. Um, first sprue we're looking at. We will just have a quick look at the undercarriage and the engine bay here. Um, that's the base of the turret. You can see that. And then you've got the engine itself. It's a typical engine from Airfix, that era. Not particularly great, not that bad. And the undercarriage oleos, these are the main undercarriage oleos. They're quite thick, so they'll hold the weight of the kit up no problem whatsoever. And that's the stinger arrestor hook. Quite nice. The engine cowling there is just run of the mill, really. Looks okay. The cockpit interior floor pan. It's not too bad. That will paint up quite nice as well. And then you've got the doors, not a lot to go on really, some small parts, the machine guns are quite nicely moulded. There's not a lot of flash on this kit, which I'm quite surprised about, but what there are is sinkholes, which I'm a bit surprised about. Um, and this is one of the issues that you had with early 60s release kits. They, there were two major issues. You had sinkholes in the airframe, which are these. Can you see the sinkholes on the rear of the elevator there? This is the underside of the elevator. The top side's all right, but the underside has got two sinkholes, and that's not very clever. The other issue you have is the rivets. The rivets on models of this era from Airfix were pretty heavy. They were festooned with rivets, and those will need to be sanded down. Um, because they're a little bit high. I think if the, this kit was one to one scale, those rivets would be about four minute, four maybe four or five inches high. 
they're quite they're quite pronounced um right the airfix propeller for the avenger it's not bad is it it's quite nicely cast but i wasn't a fan of these early airfix pilots these are typical airfix pilots that you got in the bomber command and us air force bombers and they're also found in this kit as well which is a bit of a shame not a great fan of those the other parts look pretty much flash free and then you've got um, an arrestor hook at the back here i'm hoping that's all right looks all right it's quite nicely molded it's not too bad is it it looks okay and then you've got these tiny tim rockets i think these are basically three inch rockets similar to the ones that you used on the typhoon and the mosquito and all the rest of them under carriage wheels they're quite nicely cast as well i look quite impressed with those they look okay now then, I'm going to can that one and can that one and can that part because you don't need to see all of this twice. Um, let's have a look at this first. You've got the back of the engine because the engine on this aircraft is a twin row seven cylinder engine. That's quite nicely cast as well. All you guys who like using washes and oils, you'll have, you'll have a lot of fun with those. The aileron is quite nicely cast. There's no flash on it. Um, can't see any sinkholes on that one, but there are two on that one. Can you see them? And that's really bad because they'll need to be removed completely, which is a shame. And the main wing itself again is Rivet City. That they'll need to be um, they'll need to be sanded down quite a bit. They're quite pronounced. The upper wing is the same, Rivet City, you've got the location holes for the main undercarriage legs and again Rivet City, you can see it. Quite a bit of work required to do on the airframe on this kit. And then you've got the fuselage itself. Now I've built the Academy kit in 72nd and it wasn't a bad model, but I think this kit's accuracy is slightly better than the Academy kit because the Academy kit didn't have the feel and look of this fuselage half it just didn't have it you've even got a molded exhaust pipe there that will be the same on the other side but again you've got lots and lots of rivets festooning this airframe um, which is a shame the interior detail is non-existent all you guys out there who like putting interior detail into cockpits there's loads of room on this particular model to do that i don't think you'll have an issue with that whatsoever um, but that's basically the parts the decals the instructions and everything so that's the kit looked at um, it's a typical run-of-the-mill airfix world war ii aircraft covered in rivets isn't it let's be honest uh, <laughs> yeah what I'm going to do now is I'm just going to I'm just going to um, put these plastic bits back into this box, and uh, so I can give you a nice image of the box to look at whilst I'm going through the gump to close this video down. Um, I'm going to try and be as quick as I can with this because I don't want it to take forever. There are quite a lot of parts in this kit. I go through the gump and everything, and. Um, it just gives a lot of modellers an idea of what to expect when they're building this particular kit and, and, and what you get for your money. Pop that back in there. Get all of this. Pop all that back in there. Because I don't want to lose anything. I'm trying to get spare parts for kits like this of this vintage. Airfix just laugh their heads off at you if you're after something. Anyway, that's, that's the... Um, that's the box. Right, let's read through this information. The model we're doing an inbox review on today is the Airfix Grumman TBM Mark III Avenger. Its serial number is 03033. The original release date was 1966 and the kit's molded in 172nd scale. There are decals for two versions. The first is White 129, a Grumman TBM 3 Avenger Torpedo Squadron VT-88 serving the carrier group Air Group from CVG-88 aboard USS Yorktown, which was CV-10, in the Pacific Theatre circa 1945. The
The second option is White 56, a Grumman TBM-3 Avenger Mark III from No. 703 Naval Air Squadron Fleet Air Arm, Royal Naval Air Service, serving in Ford, United Kingdom, during 1952. There are 48 parts on six grey plastic sprues and eight parts on one transparent sprue, totalling a total of 56 parts in total. The dimensions of the kit are about 6.5 inches long by 9 inches span, by about 2.5 inches high on its undercarriage. So it is going to be quite a sizable kit when it's finished. Now, the options and costs, just to differentiate between the different models of the Avenger, the TBF, as I said before, the TBF was a standard torpedo bomber version built by Grumman, and the TBM was a standard torpedo bomber ver version built by General Motors. Now, I've only covered the 172nd scale options, because if I covered the other options, the, the list would be endless. But in 72nd scale, it, it's... There are a number of options, but they're not that many. And there are as many reboxings of original standalone kits as there are standalone kits. The first is um, a TBF Mark I Avenger built by Academy Models. This kit retails for about £6 to 35 quid, although the usual cost of this kit when it sells is about £12. Um, Airfix's TBM3 Avenger retails for anything from £5 to £15. Aoshima did a TBF Avenger, no details available for pricings on that. Um, Frog produced an Avenger Mark II, which retailed for anything between £8 and £17. Hasegawa produced a TBF1 Mark one or a TBF3, a TBM3, a TBM3E Night Avenger, a Tarpon Mark II and an Avenger Mark IV. All of these are separate boxings, and they all retail for anything between £15 and £20. Hasegawa also produced a twin combi kit of an Avenger which could be built either as a TBF or a TBM and an F6F Grumman Hellcat. That kit retails for anything between £20 and £25 and they also produced a TBM1C and a TBM3 a twin Avenger pack. That's two Avengers in the same box and that retails for anything from £20 to £25 as well. Lindbergh did a rather awful Avenger which retails for about £10 to £15. Mac 2 do a really nice TBM 3W Avenger, that's the guppy style with a big radome underneath. That retails for £22 to £25. And Sword also do individual boxings of a TBM 3R, a TBM 3S, a TBM 3S2, a TBM, sorry, a Mark AS4 and an AS, an A3S Mark W Avenger. Um, all of these retail for between £19 and £22, as I said, they are individual boxings. Now, the Academy kit was reboxed by Academy Minicraft as a TBF Mark I. That retails for £12 to £27. AGA reboxed the Frog kit of the TBF Avenger. No pricing is available on that. Airfix by Craftmasters offering of the TBM3 from Airfix Rebox was about 10 to 12 quid. And Hobby 2000 also did a TBF and a TBM1C, which is a reboxed Hasegawa kit. No pricing is available on that. I haven't got any pricing available for the Far Pro of Japan Avenger, which is an, a reboxed Aoshima kit. And Limburg, the Limburg kit was reboxed as an Avenger by Limburg Nico Misa. No pricing on those either. MPC did an Airfix rebox of the TBM3 Avenger for ten to twelve pound. MRC did a rebox of the Avenger from Aoshima. That retails for anything from eight to twelve pound. Progress reboxed the frog kit of the TBF Avenger for five to ten pound. And UPC produced the a rebox of the Aoshima kit. Again, no pricing is available on that. There's also another kit from a Russian company who reboxed the frog kit that I can't pronounce. But it's it's like Donetsk Toy Factory, but it's a subsidiary of, of some company in Russia called TSK TBI MIG. Um, but the spelling is is UK Tnyan Minik, something like that. Um, yeah, that retails for five to twelve pounds. I've actually seen that on eBay and it's on sale today. Right, conclusions. Like many Airfix kits released in the late 1960s, this kit does suffer from the Rivet City phenomenon.
but it does have a reasonable interior and fairly accurate airframe. The turret rotates and for the money it's quite a sizeable model as the Avenger was the largest single-engined aircraft built during World War II. Avengers worthy of note are the Sword and Mac 2 boxings which are very good but be aware of the Limburg kit as it's probably the worst kit on the market of an Avenger in any scale you could possibly imagine. Um, I've seen an image of the Limburg kit made up um, and to all intents and purposes when you see it at first it looks all right but when you get right up close to it it is pretty dire. So anyway that's the uh, inbox review on the Grumman Avenger from Airfix. I hope this video has been of some use. Um, if you have any comments, questions, anything really, just pop them in the comments and I'll try and get back to you as quickly as possible. I hope all your modelling projects are running smooth and thanks for tuning in. I'll see you for the next one. Bye bye.